Good morning, and welcome to Ellerslie Church Online. We're so glad that you're able to join us today. If you're joining us live, we'd love to interact with you in the chat, have a chance to connect with one another. If you're joining us later on, we're also glad you're here. If we haven't met before, my name's David, and I work as part of the Adult Ministries team here at the church. I love to help people get connected here at Ellerslie and find a place to belong within this amazing community. Now, let's join together in worship as our team leads us in song. Feel free to stand and sing along at home or sit and reflect on the words that are being sung. Welcome. Thanks for joining Ellerslie Church's Traditions Service. Join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, fill our hearts and mouths with praise as we worship you this day. Thank you for all your blessings for those in the past and those that are yet to come in this new year. Bless this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most prolific songwriters coming out of the Great Awakening was Charles Wesley. Today we are going to sing some of his beloved hymns, starting with Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. call to worship today is from John chapter 1, verses 43 to 50. The next day, Jesus decided to leave Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. 
Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus' reference to the angels reminds me of the myriad of heavenly hosts that appeared to the shepherds near Bethlehem. Let's continue to sing our praise with this hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. As we prepare to hear from God's word today, let's join in this final song, Soldiers of Christ, Arise. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your God supplies through his eternal Son, strong in the Lord of hosts, and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus' trust is more than Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unchanging love and compassion, that you are the same today and forever. 
And as our current circumstances feel like they are changing all the time, you are constant, and that we can find refuge in you in our turmoil. Father, we pray for our government leaders as they balance the weights of public safety and running a country. Give them wisdom and guidance. Help our neighbors south of the border as they go through a time of transition with their government. Give them peace and rest. We thank you for our global mission partner, Connie Doherty. Thank you for all that you have taught her in this season and continue to lead her as she continues to do your kingdom work in Italy. Keep her creative and ready to do your work. Thank you that you have a plan, that you plan to redeem your people. Help us to join in on the work that you are already doing in our world and help us not to push our own agenda, but to accept your plan and join together saying your kingdom come and your will be done. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Before we dive into this week's message, we have a few things that we think you need to know about. The church board has called a special meeting to vote on the proposal to affirm Pastor Dave Schmidt as the next lead pastor for Ellerslie. This meeting will include a discussion of the anticipated transition timeline for succession from Pastor Mel to Pastor Dave. This meeting will be held on February 7th through Zoom. The time of the meeting will be announced next week. All those who consider Ellerslie to be their church home are welcome to join us for this important meeting, which will be conducted via Zoom. Registration is required and an advance ballot is available for members who are unable to attend. To register or to receive a meeting package, please contact the church office at office at erbc.ca. Almost every week, I get to talk to people about getting more connected or more involved here at Ellerslie. For many, that means getting involved with a serve team, connecting in a small group, or participating in one of our larger ministries. If you're looking to get more involved, to meet and connect with others here at Ellerslie, or looking for ways to engage with the Bible and grow deeper in your faith, now is the perfect time to get started. Ladies Morning Out and Alpha are both starting up right now and provide opportunities to connect with others as you work through various curriculum or as you explore faith with the Alpha course. Another great option is small groups and triads. Small groups are groups of 8 to 12 who meet together a couple of times a month to study the Bible and connect with one another. And triads are smaller groups of 3 to 5 that meet regularly to grow deeper with one another. If joining a small group, a triad, or connecting with a ministry like Ladies Morning Out or Alpha interests you, I'd encourage you to fill out a connect card at erbc.ca slash connect or email us at groups at erbc.ca. We'd love to help you get connected. Your faithful giving allows us to continue producing services, our devotional videos, and support our local care teams and our global missions partners all around the world. There are a variety of ways that you can continue to support Ellerslie, including by mail, setting up pre-authorized giving, and giving online. For more information on these options and to give online, head on over to erbc.ca slash give. Now, grab your pen, a notebook, and a Bible, and let's dive into this week's message on the life of David. Wherever you are, however you're listening, thanks for making us part of your day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life of David. And thank you for all the lessons that we can learn. God, as we continue to open up 1 Samuel and hear about what's taking place, May our imaginations continue to expand as we engage with Israel's greatest king. May my words fall down so that yours would be lifted up as we are drawn closer to a relationship with you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our culture is obsessed with celebrity. Athletes, musicians, movie stars, YouTubers, royalty, niche markets. Everyone has celebrities they enjoy following. I'm a sports guy, and sports are always arguing about the GOAT the greatest of all time. Who's better? Is it LeBron James or is it Michael Jordan? The NFL playoffs are well underway. Will anyone ever be as good as Tom Brady? How would Wayne Gretzky perform in today's NHL? An interesting conversation that's taking place in the film industry right now is the question about whether or not has COVID killed the movie theater? We have these enormous buildings that have been sitting completely empty for almost a year. Will they be able to bounce back? Enter one of the superstars of celebrity, Tom Hanks. He was asked recently if he thought theaters would survive, and he responded, I'm paraphrasing here, absolutely they will. But it might be the end of movies with anything interesting to say. After this, it will be owned by a big budget comic book movies and franchises. Is it true? Who knows? But Tom Hanks said it. I know there are world-renowned experts on climate change and events the world over, but whose name gets all the headlines? Greta Thunberg. Our culture loves celebrities. Just for fun, if you're watching live on YouTube or church online platform, if you could have lunch with one famous person, they have to be alive today, who would you want to have lunch with? 
post it in the comments. We'd love to read your answers. Who's the one celebrity you would like to have lunch with? It's easy to think about the big categories of celebrities. We talked about musicians and actors, athletes and YouTubers, but most of us have niche interests as well. Someone in business might want to sit down with Jeff Bezos and ask how he became one of the richest people in the world simply by starting in his garage. An artist might have their favorite instructor from Juilliard, a construction worker, their favorite HGTV personality. Me, I love the NFL and I love the church and I have to choose who I would go out with. Would it be somebody who's an NFL personality or somebody who's a pastor? Over Christmas break, I was listening to an interview with a very well-known American pastor. And the interview was just gushing over him, his accomplishments and everything he's done. Listening to the pastor's tone of voice, I thought he sounded embarrassed as though he was saying, why are you making such a big deal out of me? What's funny is the interviewer is a big deal himself. There are Christian magazines that talk about America's most influential pastors, the fastest growing churches, 25 best websites, preachers and sneakers. If it sounds like I'm making that last one up, I promise you I'm not. These Christian men and women soar to popularity. What happens next? If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open up to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. One way to always have a Bible with you is to download the app on your smartphone at bible.com app. Or if you're watching on our brand new church online platform, you'll notice a Bible tab on the left-hand side where you can have the Bible open as you watch. Of course, if you're old school like me, you still like holding that physical copy. If you're new to church, the Bible can be a bit of an intimidating book. At the front, uh, you'll find a table of contents. First Samuel is in the Old Testament, which means it happens before the birth of Jesus. The big numbers are the chapter numbers, the small numbers are the verse numbers. And as you're flipping to chapter 17, verse 55, allow me to set the scene. On one side of the valley is the army of the Philistines, led by a giant of a man who challenged God's people every morning and every night for 40 days. Why do you line up for battle and waste all this blood? Send your champion, the best fighter in your army, and we will fight. If I win, you will be our slaves. If you win, we will be your slaves. For 40 days, the Israelites, God's chosen people, quaked in fear until a shepherd by the name of David convinced his king to let him fight. He took his sling, a few stones, and with the accuracy and velocity of a major league pitcher, sent one of those baseball-sized rocks right between the giant's eyes and knocked him out cold. If you missed last week, I invite you to hop on YouTube or download the podcast and check out Pastor Mel as he lays out what happens in much greater detail. Picking up now at the end of chapter 17, verses 55 to 58. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, O king, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son that young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. And David said, I'm the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. A celebrity is born. Goliath's fall shook more than just the ground. The whole nation has stopped to take notice, including Jonathan, the son of the king. This is 18 verses 1 to 4. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. The very first thing that happened after Goliath's death is the start of a lifelong friendship with the person who should have been most jealous of David, since Jonathan was the natural heir to the throne. Instead, something extraordinary happens. There is so much more than the wealthy son of a king sharing clothes with a shepherd from the countryside. This is the heir to the throne removing the mantle of kingship and placing it on God's anointed kingdom has been transferred. When Saul dies, David is to be named king. There's no jealousy between Jonathan and David, but rather the beginning of an incredible friendship, something we'll look at in detail in next week's message. Whether or not the people of David uh, know of David's anointing back in chapter 16, 
one thing is clear to everybody who meets him. There is something incredibly special about this man. God and most everyone else are with David. Reading the chapter uh, in its fullness, you'll hear this repetition of the love and of the support that's going out for our young hero. His fame is rising and the people of Israel are loving it. In chapter 18 alone, there are four references to David's success, three assertions that God is with David and six uses of love towards him. Saul's kids, who should have been the most jealous of David, absolutely love him. Twice we read that his son Jonathan loves David. Twice we read that Saul's daughter Michal loves David and eventually marries him. The other two occurrences of love are found in verse 16, where we read of Israel and Judah's love for David. And in verse 22, where we read that even the servants love him. In fact, it would seem that the only person who doesn't love the young man is Saul himself. Chapter 18, verses 5 to 16. Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands? What more can he get but my kingdom? From that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Even the most beloved of celebrities have their detractors. I mentioned just a moment ago how the whole nation loves David. The servants love David. Saul's kids who have the most to lose love David. But it's Saul, the king of Israel the most powerful person in the nation, the one who discovered the shepherd from Bethlehem and is enjoying his success, he's the one who's jealous. I like what one commentator, David Sumura, says, Saul's primary concern was not the Lord's honor or the people's welfare, but himself. Before we shake our head and discuss at what Saul is doing, let's take a minute to look in the mirror. Most of us want to see our organization and even our friends succeed. It doesn't matter if we work in schools, hospitals, businesses, trades, whatever. If our organization succeeds, then we normally succeed. A journeyman welder wants his company to get more contracts. More contracts equals more work, maybe a little bit of overtime. And if things go well, maybe more hires will be necessary. And he can bring his buddy from trade school. Life is good. But what happens if things work out exactly as planned? right down to your best friend being hired. And then people start to like him more than they like you. In fact, not only is he an excellent welder, but your coworkers think he's funny, he has leadership potential, he's a great team guy, and they start to look up to him. And in only five months, he becomes shop foreman. And suddenly he's your boss? Are you still happy about that? I have twin sisters and they're both quite successful and I'm genuinely happy for them. One lives in Southern Alberta, one lives Vancouver and they have great lives. But how would I feel if they moved in a couple's doors down from me? In a house with a three car garage, 400 extra square feet of living space, a hot tub in the backyard and a brand new car in the driveway every two years. Am I still thrilled if I can see it every day? The nation of Israel is flourishing, but the king is fuming. Suddenly Saul has thrown a lifeline. His daughter, Michal, has fallen in love with David. And maybe, just maybe, Saul can use this to his advantage. A poor shepherd could never afford the dowry for a king's daughter. So instead of money, Saul asked for a hundred Philistine foreskins. Saul's plan was simple. 
Why should I kill David myself if our enemies will do it for me? Saul was hoping that the same zeal that made David so well loved would be the thing that kills him and the threat to the throne would be removed. Saul has a problem. God's anointing has been placed on David. You can read it in 1 Samuel 16. And God's plan cannot be stopped. This is where God's protection for David is incredible. We think it's a good idea to have, who thinks it's a good idea to have one man kill a hundred of the, of the enemy? Nobody. It's a terrible idea. But David loves it. He can't afford a dowry. And this is a way of showing the king that his future father-in-law, that he's worth it. So David grabs a couple of his buddies and doubles the request, free of charge, and brings back 200 Philistine foreskins. 18 verses 28 and 29. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemies the rest of his days. At this point, things start to get comical. One commentator even writes, our story seems to have degenerated into a soap opera. At no point in chapter 18 do we learn of Saul sharing his intent to kill David. Even the bride price of 100 Philistine foreskins, completely Saul's idea. And for our astute listeners this morning, you might be thinking, um, one question. Didn't we read that Saul threw a spear at David not once but twice? That kind of shows a malicious intent. You'd be absolutely correct. But if you take another look at what happens at the incident right before chapter 18, verse 10, it says the next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. I'm sure there were some who thought Saul might be trying to kill David. But most of the servants in the inner circle looked at this as though Saul just had a horrible mood. Everyone knew how volatile his temper could be. Even the passage says he wasn't trying to kill David. Just scare him a little bit. Back to some underlying humor. This isn't that belly laugh listening to your favorite comedian. This is more a smile when things just don't go as planned. We just read about how Saul sends David out to be killed, only to have him come back an even bigger hero. And that's what we're about to learn in chapter 19. Saul's going to tell his kids he wants to kill David. Instead, they choose David over him. The future king, David himself, escapes through the window like a teenage lover being caught by dad. Saul and his messengers start prophesying when they go searching for David. And Saul finds himself literally naked in front of the prophet who anointed him. The evil spirit of Saul has infected the whole scene. And something else becomes abundantly clear. God's plan cannot be stopped. Chapter 19 begins with Saul telling Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. But this is Jonathan's best friend we're talking about. And he decides to step up and talk some sense into the king, picking up in chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what has he done, what he's done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David? By killing him for no reason. In only two verses, Jonathan is giving an impassioned plea to his father in hopes of talking some sense into him. First thing Jonathan does is talk to him about the relationship between Saul and David. Dad, think about what it is you're considering. You're the king. Attacking a lowly servant, someone who loves you, who serves you, who's always put our nation first. If the relationship alone isn't enough, consider a rational argument. Dad, everything David has done has benefited you. In going to battle against the Philistines, your kingdom benefited. In fighting against the Philistine champion, he took your place so you would be safe. He had been a faithful and loyal soldier, never complaining, going wherever you sent him. Your kingdom has expanded. As if Jonathan's speech isn't persuasive enough already, he gives a theological argument. Dad, are we not all here because God has brought us to this place? It was God who anointed you. God who brought Israel victory. God who should be honoring, should be honored through all this success. And then there's that whole morality thing. Dad... David is innocent. Murder is evil. 
Killing him for absolutely no reason seems like a really bad idea. Two verses, four reasons. A relationship, a rational argument, theological understanding, and oh yeah, don't murder innocent people. It's a pretty persuasive speech. In verse 6, Saul listens to Jonathan and takes this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Excellent job. Great work, Jonathan. You can write in your journal that night. Tonight, I saved my best friend from being murdered by my father. Soon after, another war breaks out against the Philistines. Saul sends David out once again, who predictably has more great success. The enemy flees away from him and Saul gets jealous once again. That happens in four verses. We pick up our story in verse 11. Now with the daughter of the king protecting her husband. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run away for your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol, laid it on the bed, covered it with a garment, and put some goat's hair at the head. When, Saul's men sent the, uh, when Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, he's ill. And Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in his bed so that I might kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? And Michal replied, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? By this time, Saul is furious. His son persuades him not to kill David. That was obviously terrible advice. His daughter plots to save her husband. She can't be trusted. If you want to do something right, do it yourself. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Let's pause for a moment chapter begins with Jonathan convincing his dad not to kill David. Michal, Saul's daughter and David's wife, also manages to protect him. And now we arrive at Samuel, the mighty prophet, the man whose name is the title of this book, who's anointed Saul, who's chastised Saul, who breaks the news that God has rejected Saul. Surely this man will put Saul in the place that he needs to be. Nope. While the scriptures don't tell us anything about the conversation, we get this picture of Samuel, the mighty prophet, and David, the anointed one, fleeing in fear. In verses 19 to 23, we see God flex his muscles. Word came to Saul. David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men. They prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went, and went to the great cistern at Siku, and he asked, Where are David and Samuel? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came upon him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his robes and also prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay that way all day and night. And this is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? God's plan cannot be stopped. This is incredible showing of God's providence and God's power. As powerful as the king is, he cannot overcome God's anointing of David. This aggressive, angry king is humbled, even comically humiliated by stripping off all his clothes and finding himself naked before the man who anointed him. Chapter 18 begins with Jonathan willfully removing his robe and laying it at David's feet. Chapter 19 ends with Saul being stripped of both clothes and dignity as he lays his royal authority at both the feet of Samuel and David. Our series is titled, Not Be Shaken. And while David's faith in God seems unwavering, that doesn't mean circumstances won't rattle you from time to time. There's this beautiful verse in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 that reads, We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. 
And I believe this is where David finds himself. I'd imagine he's incredibly relieved that God has miraculously intervened and kept Saul from killing him. But David has no intention of sticking around and seeing how long the spirit of prophecy will last. And so he books it back to Jonathan to let him know what's going on, picking up in chapter 20, verse one. David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, Jonathan replied. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without confiding in me. Why would he hide that from me? It's not true. Jonathan has no clue that a king has been trying to kill his best friend. He's completely shocked at the news because he thought he had talked his dad out of this crazy plan. But why would Saul, knowing Jonathan is pro-David, keep him abreast of his plans? David's not looking for answers from Jonathan. David's trying to convince Jonathan that what he's saying is true. And the reality is hitting him hard. Verse 3. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between me and death. And you're certainly welcome to read the rest of chapter 20 on your own, but that's where we're going to end for today before we pick up our story next week and hear how all of it unfolds. It seems pretty clear that God's plan cannot be stopped. Saul tried to have the enemy to kill David, only to have come back as a hero. Saul then told his closest advisors to kill David, only to have his son talk him down, his daughter trick him, and God flex his muscles. And I'm left to wonder, where do we find ourselves in this story? David is a precursor to Jesus himself, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But I wonder if our lives resemble that of Jonathan, Michal, or Saul. The last name might have you raise a few eyebrows. Saul? Pastor Dave, how on earth would my life be resembling Saul? But hear me out, because it might not be as crazy as you think. Earlier in the message, I shared that quote by David Sumura that says, Saul's primary concern was not the Lord's honor or the people's welfare, but himself. So why don't we ask ourselves a simple question? Outside of work and school, and certainly for the homemakers who are listening, I consider what you do all day work. What is your primary focus right now? What's your primary focus outside of school and work right now? Dave, 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 it's COVID. How am I supposed to do God stuff when we're not even meeting at the church? You may never have more time to focus on your relationship with God than you do right now. You may ne never have more time to connect with other Christians than you do right now. You may never have more time to serve your community than you do right now. I'm not saying you're working against God. I'm saying you might not even be thinking about him. But what can you do? Mikal was fascinated. She saw a man who struck down a giant who served her father, who was a military champion, and she fell in love with him. And when hearing her dad was about to kill him, she got creative in how she could join God's unstoppable plan. One of the things I deeply appreciate about Pastor Mel is how he often asks the question, what does this make possible? What does this circumstance make possible? You know what? We can't meet in person right now. We can't meet together on Sundays. We can't meet in small groups. We can't be physically present with friends and family. It sucks. But what can we do? Most people now have more freedom in their schedules. Is this the perfect time to connect with a few other people and start doing life together? What does this moment make possible? Maybe you resonate most with Jonathan. Here we have a picture of uncommon loyalty. He didn't just become friends with David. He didn't just make a promise to David. He entered into a covenant with David. 
Jumping back to the beginning of chapter 18, verses 1 and 3, we read this. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan realized something unstoppable was taking place. And rather than fighting against it, he joined right in, giving his very life to the cause. Someone much greater than David has arrived. In the person of Jesus Christ, we have an anointed king and someone who is eternally perfect sitting on the throne. He has entered into a covenant relationship with us and is calling us to uncommon loyalty. He is inviting us to use our spirit-filled imagination to ask, what does this make possible? And intervene in the life of Saul, not the one that's the king we just talked about, but a different one in the New Testament after the life of Jesus and transforms him from working against the church to building the church up. Over the coming weeks, we will see that David's life is spared and he will become king of Israel. But just as there were powerful people pursuing David's life, there were also powerful people pursuing Jesus' life. While David is spared from death at the hands of his enemies, Jesus experienced death at the hands of his enemies. But his death was not the end. Oh no, his death was only the beginning because God's plan cannot be stopped. And three days later, he rose triumphantly from the grave, not as the king of Israel, but as king of the whole world, a kingdom that will not be shaken and invites us to uncommon loyalty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this passage, we see Saul start his downward slide. And we see David interacting with Saul, interacting with Michal, interacting with Jonathan. And God, I ask that we would forgive, that you would forgive us for times where we have not pursued you the way we should, where we have stepped in the way of your unstoppable plan. God, I ask that you would give us a great imagination. How can we use this time, this moment, this place to serve you well, and that you would fill us with an unstoppable loyalty to you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. It was great to worship together and dive into the message. If you have questions about this week's message or would like to go deeper, we have a set of sermon-based readings to allow you to dig into the Bible throughout the week. You can find those readings in the description of this video down below. If you enjoyed our service, feel free to give this video a like, to share it with your friends, and subscribe to stay tuned with all of our videos here on YouTube. Make sure you comment down below what your biggest takeaway from the service was. As we wrap up our time together, some slides are going to roll with some connecting opportunities and some upcoming events. As those scroll, feel free to hang out in the chat, share your thoughts on the message. We hope to see you next week.
ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I'll raise it, hallelujah, with everything inside of me. I'll raise it hallelujah And I'll watch the darkness flee I'll raise it hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I'll raise it Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a 